pushing um, the front, uh, and it's getting harder to push further. It's getting more and more difficult. So I talked about this. Um, more cores on a chip, more parallel programs, larger working set, so we want, naturally, we want larger memory capacity. And also, uh, emerging applications are becoming more data intensive. Their working sets are getting larger as uh, modern, modern applications tend to crunch through huge amounts of data. Um, so this is another push for higher memory capacity. And also um, the, the consolidation of devices that we're seeing these days of, say, uh, GPU hardware or having lots of virtual machines on the machine. These, these all share a, a main memory, a shared resource. So um, the push for memory capacity is, is increasing. Um, this, this graph shows uh, the gap between the growth in the core count in chip multiprocessors and also the, uh, um, the capacity, the DRAM capacity on systems. And here we see that the number of core counts is, is growing at a much faster rate so um, in order to bridge this gap, people are looking into emerging memory technologies. So yeah, um, we want more memory capacity. And main memory is, is becoming a, a bigger and bigger uh, source of, of power consumption. And also the thing with DRAM is that because it needs periodic refresh, the memory that we write in DRAM won't stay there unless we keep on writing, reading and writing the data again, if you will. We have to refresh that data. So even if we have some data in, in DRAM and not do anything, it'll still continue to consume energy, um, which, which contributes to the uh, energy consumption. And like I said, DRAM technology scaling is becoming more and more difficult. Um, I, I, I do believe, though, that there are actually, uh, so, so the most current DRAM products are actually down to 30x nanometers, I think 32 nanometers or something like that. And it is, it is DRAM is continuing to evolve. And uh, it's, it's unclear, I guess, um, whether uh, future systems will continue to use DRAM or they'll move on to emerging memory technologies. But, um, so there are, there's a lot of research going on in this area. At least uh, a lot of people, I think, think that it'll be some combination of DRAM and emerging memory technology. I'll talk about that soon. And yeah, this is the, so, so why, is it, why is it getting more difficult to scale DRAM? So what I mean by scaling is making DRAM smaller, making each memory cell in DRAM smaller. And what that enables us to do is enables us to, in the same, space of, of silicon dye, we can fit more cells in. So that's increasing bit density, hence we get lar larger memory capacity in the same amount of uh, silicon. And the reason why it's, it's getting more and more difficult to, to do this, to, to make DRAM smaller, is because the way DRAM works is um, we, we take a small amount of charge and store it in a capacitor. That's what essentially DRAM is. We tell what um, data is stored by checking this charge, the presence of this charge in this capacitor. Refresh is essentially um, is, is replenishing the charge in the capacitor before it, it completely leaks out. So in DRAM there's a ca capacitor that's leaky and we put charge in there to say represent a, a bit of value one. And if there's no charge in the capacitor then it, re it represents a bit value of zero. That's, that's what DRAM is. Now, the smaller we make, that's, that's um, a DRAM cell, but that's what a DRAM cell looks like. Um, and the smaller we, we make a DRAM cell, the smaller the charge is that we can store in that capacitor. So, so that's why it's, it's and, and that can't like, like just mm, reduce into nothing. There, we, the, the capacitor has to be still big enough to store some amount of appreciable charge that's why DRAM scaling is getting more, more and more difficult. Yeah, that's, yeah. 
So I was talking about um, the, the memory, the, the trends we see in, in memory requirements and and because DRAM uh, scaling is getting more and more difficult, it's becoming difficult to satisfy all these memory requirements with DRAM alone in terms of capacity, bandwidth, energy consumption. So what, we, what, what do we want in an ideal memory system? If say we, we weren't um, limited to DRAM. Um, so we have what we want from memory. There's the traditional view of what we want from memory. And um, so I some, some new trends in memory, I guess, uh, that comes with multi-core processors, um, uh, memory sharing via uh, consolidation, virtual machines, GPUs, accelerators. And we want basically the similar stuff, but the, the restrictions, the, the we, we want more out of memory, I guess. We want memory to be even larger capacity, uh, even more energy efficient. And as we're sharing mem memory between different cores and different processing elements, we want some degree of uh, quality of service. We want guaranteed uh, performance from memory to be able to do a certain task for us within, within certain bounds so we, can, so we know that you know, certain tasks aren't getting starved uh, from memory. And there is increasing um, research uh, looking at emerging resistive memory technologies to try and satisfy these um, harsher memory requirements. So this is, I guess, uh, the meat of the talk, emerging memory technologies. So we're looking at other memory technologies, uh, something that's uh, quite different from DRAM, how we can help uh, uh, satisfy these new memory requirements. Um, and some, there's actually a lot of uh, emerging technologies. Uh, you might have heard about these. Uh, there's something called phase change memory, also called like PC RAM, um, calcogenide. Uh, it's, it's the same thing, phase change memory. Um, there's something called uh, STT MRAM, spin torque transfer, that should say magnetoresistive memory. Um, and that's, that's a more, uh, say, advanced version of, of the traditional MRAM, the MRAM of, of the field. So, so MRAM used to be field um, activated, but now it's spin, spin torque activated. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Memristors is, is another big thing. It's a very overloaded term, though. It's, Different people have different ideas of what a memristor exactly is. And, um, and there's actually like a few more like FRAM. And I guess these are the most promising candidates that are under um, a lot of research right now. Uh, so, so we're gonna, you know, uh, there's a lot of research is going on about how these memory uh, technologies can be incorporated into the, into the computer architecture, what needs to change about computer architecture in order to be able to uh, incorporate these memory technologies and uh, have higher memory performance. Uh, so here is some background about emerging memory technologies. Um, I was mentioning that uh, DRAM uh, is a memory that works by storing amount of charge, so is flash. And these are, I guess, the prevalent solid state forms of memory that are in use these days. Um, and they, they work by capturing amount of charge in a capacitor, uh, in the case of DRAM, or in the case of flash, in a, in a floating uh, gate. Um, and for resistive memories, uh, usually what happens is data is written uh, using some kind of electrical current. Now, what the, electro what the electrical current does in the different memory technologies is, is a bit different for, for each technology. Um, and the reason why they're called resistive is because uh, these, these current end up changing the resistance of the memory element. Um, and that's how uh, the data is read off from the, from the memory cells later on. So I was mentioning um, in flash, there's a, a floating gate. And 
Uh, with flash, what happens is uh, we, we store charge in that floating gate. That floating gate is actually um, insulated from either the source or the drain or the gate, but uh, we use tunneling effects to get electrons onto those floating gate. And depending on whether there are electrons or not in the floating gate, the, resist the resistance between the source and the drain will vary. Um, and uh, that's, that's how flash works. Um, in, in DRAM, uh, we, we store a charge in a capacitor, and we read off that charge value. That's how DRAM works. And both, both technologies, um, the reason why it's getting more and more difficult to scale these down, to make these things very small on silicon, is because as those capacitors or, or those floating gates get smaller and smaller, uh, the amount of charge that you can store in them gets so small, it kind of becomes not very detectable. I think for flash, uh, like when, when, when feature sizes get down to something like 10 nanometers, some, 10 nanometers or something, uh, mathematically the amount of charge that you can store on a floating gate is, is so small that you, it, it, that you can start to count the number of electrons that are actually on the floating gate. And because that's such a small charge, it's, it's getting almost impossible to, to detect that that amount of charge. So Flash is also looking at different ways to scale. They're, they're looking at, um, uh, they're, they're thinking, they're, there's um, research going on in Flash that's actually scaling in the upward direction. So if you're looking down on a piece of silicon, they're not trying to make it smaller, like 2D wise, but they're making um, floating gates that go vertically or something like that. Um, and DRAM is, is also uh, doing lots of different things. And um, emerging, mem emerging resistive memory technologies. Um, I'm going to talk more about PCM, phase change memory in particular later. But phase change memory is, um, so I'll, I'll keep it at this. Um, so all of these re uh, emerging resistive memory technologies use electrical current in one way or, or, or another to manipulate the state, the physical state of a memory element. And in most cases, the, the physical change um, is uh, manifested in, in, uh, in a change of resistance value of that, of that memory element. So in PCM, in phase change memory, the heat aspect of electrical current is used. So with that heat, we're going to change the, we, uh, they change the memory element somehow. Um, in, in MRAM, it used to be that uh, you, you would use the electrical field of, 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 a, of a current going through a wire and use that field to switch um, the, the polarity of, of, a, of a cell. But these days, um, spin, what spin torque transfer MRAM does is it uses the electron spin of the electrons in a current, and that is used to change the polarity of, of a cell. Um, so. So a very quick version of this is basically in an MRM cell there is something called the magnetic tunneling junction. And in the, in the magnetic tunnel junction there are two layers of, of, of magnetic layers and they have a polarity. So they can be either parallel or anti-parallel. And in this, and we have current going through like that. Um, in this orientation, the, the, the resistance of the magnetic tunnel junction is low but you can use the spin, the electron spin of a current to flip one of the layers, um, the, pl the polarity of one of the layers to make it anti-parallel. And in this um, situation, the resistance of the whole magnet magnetic tunneling junction is high. Uh, so that's, that's uh, the kind of crash course for SDT MRAM. And um, for memristors, memristors is, is, is kind of a vague term actually. So is I guess in the most general sense, a memristor is a device where, it's, it's a two terminal device where you, you, if you flow current through it in one direction, the resistance of it will drop. If you flow current in the opposite direction, the resistance of the, 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 the memristor will increase. Um, and there are actually lots of different implementations of the memristor. There are many different devices that have that property. Um, uh, I mean, in, in, in one interpretation, the STT MRAM is, is a form of a memristor. 
Um, and uh, HP has their form of the memory stir, and there are different Im implementations. Um, and uh, yes, uh, for some implementations, the physics can get rather um, nitty gritty and uh, difficult to understand. But those are some emerging resistive memory technologies. And um, I'm going to talk more about phase change memory in particular because it's, I guess, um, the kind of, uh, kind of memory technology that's um, quite well developed. There are actually uh, memory products for PCM that are available right now. Um, whereas for STT, MRAM, and memristors, there's still a lot in the research phase. So what is phase change memory? Phase change memory essentially, um, its, its memory element is this material called calcogenide. And how we manipulate this material is by using electrical current, the heat of electrical current, we melt this piece of, or we, we, we apply heat to this memory element, calcogenide. If we melt it and then quench it, let it cool very quickly, the, the memory element is going to be in an amorphous phase that has high resistance. But if we, just, if we don't do that, if we just take the, um, the element to a, 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 like a temperature, a reasonably high temperature, and just let it um, cool very slowly, what happens inside the calcogenic material is that it starts to crystallize. And it, it becomes a crystalline state. And in that form, its, its resistance is low. So using electrical current, we can have high resistance calcogenide or low resistance, resistance calcogenide. If we read off that value, then we can tell, I mean, we can use that uh, phenomenon to, to store data. Um, so that's the representation of uh, calcogenide. Um, so, yes? This is also volatile, right? The this heat. is non-volatile. Uh, so what you'd actually do is, um, so for the amorphous case, so in, in either case, after you apply heat, they will solidify, they, they will come to like a solid state, like a, a final state, and they will be stable at that state. Um, at least there is this, there is this kind of slow, there's another effect called the resistance drift effect that's, um, that, that kind of affects the resistance of, of the cell. But if you, if, if, but that kind of happens over a long time. Um, at least in the short term, these, these uh, memory elements come to a state that is, is somewhat stable after the heat is removed. Yes, so it's non-volatile because after you take away the electrical current or the whole power from the chip, it'll still uh, remember what, what data it is written into the cells. So this is just what I've been um, talking about, I guess. Um, so actually, yeah, I'll just describe. So what ha what's happening here is, uh, so, so, so here's a bit of metal, here's a bit of metal. And between those bit of metals is, is going to be our um, calcogenite material, well, specifically this dark um, region. And uh, that's, that's, the, that's the calcogenite material that has those amorphous or crystalline properties. This is just a heater um, where that will carry the electrical current that's going to apply heat to the calcogenide um, material. And that, that, that this kind of semicircle here is the portion of calcogenide that actually melts and recrystallizes. Um, and, and on the right, this is a, a circuit representation of, of phase change memory. Um, and yeah, this is uh, what I've been describing. Um, so the, well, the, the, the electrical current that actually melts the calcogenate material and, qu and then quenches it quickly, that process is called um, the reset. So it puts calcogenate in a very um, high, resist high resistance state. And uh, the, res uh, the set is the one where we take it to a crystallizing temperature and let it cool very slowly. Um, and the resistance difference, the resistance difference between the amorphous state and the crystalline state is about three orders of magnitude in terms of ohms. 
So there's actually a, um, a wide resistance range there between the two um, states. And this is just a pictorial representation of, um, of, of the calcocyanide material. Um, so some PCM advantages. Uh, so compared to DRAM, it's projected, at least, that phase change memory will, will scale to smaller feature sizes uh, more easily. Um, like I said, uh, phase change memory is not uh, limited by how much charge you need to store in the memory element. So this is one of the reasons why it's projected to scale to smaller sizes. Um, yeah, currently prototyped at 20 nanometers and expected to scale down to nine nanometers in the future. Um, so scalability means uh, density, uh, higher bit density, lower cost, higher capacity. They're all, I guess, pretty much more or less the same thing. Um, and uh, because I also talked about this large um, resistance difference between the amorphous state and the crystalline state, because there's this large resistance gap between the two states, we can actually put in intermediate states between those extreme states and have one cell represent more than two bits. So this is called multi-level cell and it's another advantage of PCM um, over DRAM uh, for, for greater density. And uh, yeah, it's phase change of memory is also non-volatile uh, and no refresh is needed, hence. Uh, so I'll talk about some parameters for phase change memory, some, some uh, numbers that will give us uh, a feel as to how well this, this, this new memory um, device performs. So uh, this paper is, um, this paper is, uh, it also includes <coughs> a survey of recent phase change memory prototypes from 2003 to 2008. And um, I'll talk more about this paper later, but yeah, in terms of the grand scheme of things, this is where phase change memory sits in the um, realm of the memory hierarchy, I guess, in, in terms of access latency. So it's slower than DRAM, but still a lot faster uh, than, than storage to be considered as um, a memory device uh, to be used for main, main memory. Um, read latency is still higher than DRAM, but very, a lot quicker than flash. And uh, write latency is also higher. So, so phase change memory has um, a write latency that's a lot higher than read latency because we saw the set pulse just now where um, we take the calcocyanide material, take it up to a crystallizing temperature and we need the calcocyanide to crystallize. Um, it takes a bit of time to do that process. That's what bounds the, the write latency. Um, there's, there's another work that tries to um, kind, of, kind of deal with that effect of phase change memory, but uh, yeah, anyways, write bandwidth is also um, lower than DRAM. Dynamic energy is, is higher, and w another artifact of phase change memory is that it has limited um, endurance, and more specifically, write endurance, so you can only write to a phase change uh, memory element um, a, fix, a finite number of times. Um, this is, I guess, more or less true for a lot of memory technologies, but, it, but for the case of DRAM, because uh, the write endurance is so high, people kind of think of it almost as being, like having almost infinite endurance, almost. Um, and in case of uh, uh, phase change memory, well, 10 to the eight writes is, is a lot more, um, is a lot less than, than DRAM. It's far from infinite, so that's uh, one, another di uh, one disadvantage of phase change memory. Um, and in terms of cell size, it's, it's a bit larger than DRAM, but the reason why, so, so in terms of F, F is the feature size. Um, so I guess that's like the width of the thinnest line you could draw on silicon. Um, and in terms of F, although, although the cell size of PCM is projected to be larger because F itself can be smaller um, in, uh, in, in phase change memories. Um, the overall scalability of, of PCM is still higher. Uh, yes? Is reading, so if reading from PCM also involves sending current through a PCM cell, does uh, reading from DRAM degrade its, like does, does reading from DRAM force it to be rewritten eventually? Or sorry, not be out of PCM, does reading from PCM force it to be rewritten eventually? Re 
rewritten. Um, so you mean like refresh? Like the. So it's rewritten. So like the reading from these stuff, you say it's helping grade the reliability of the. Oh, can can reading can there be like a read endurance issue? You mean? Yeah. Um, not that I know of. I haven't. Or even if there is, maybe it's shadowed by the fact that write endurance is a lot is, is a bigger constraint than read endurance. Um, if there were read endurance, so the, the I guess the the cause for this endurance effect is because um, when we write to PCM, um, it's applying a, a, a very high uh, amount of a large amount of heat, and that um, and heat causes physical dimensions to expand and, and you know, when the heat is removed, things will contract. So that repeated um, expansion and contraction between the heating element and the, and the calcogenite element is, is what causes this um, endurance, this finite endurance issue. Now, I guess reading from a, a calcogenite cell also induces some non-zero amount of current to go through the phase change element. And that, I guess that will also come with a small amount of heat generated. Um, but I would say it's, it's, it's orders of magnitude smaller than the amount of current that we will drive through the um, calcogenite element during a write operation. So even if the read operation caused an appreciable amount of heat, that would eventually um, cause enough expansion and contraction for there to be a read endurance on PCM. I think that will be completely overshadowed by the same effect happening via writes because write currents is a lot higher. And, we're, and let's say if, if we weren't to just use almost phase change memory almost as a one-time write device, then we'll read current, uh, generate enough expansion contraction to cause read endurance. Uh, not that I know of, not that I've ever heard of. There could be maybe, but I haven't heard anything of the sort yet. Um, so uh, comparing phase change memory and DRAM, uh, so P the, the advantages of PCM would be that it has um, better technology scaling, uh, non-volatility, and low idle power, at least, when we're not writing to the device. If, we're the, if the device were just there, we, there would be no need to re uh, com continuously refresh the device. But um, some cons include uh, higher latency, higher uh, dynamic energy, so every time we write or read from the device, we're expending more energy and lower endurance. Um, so the challenges in enabling phase change memory to be used in, in, in main memory of computers is coming up of ways of try, trying to mitigate these effects of, of the shortcomings of phase change memory and, and finding the right way to uh, place phase change memory in the memory hierarchy of, of well, within computer architecture. So yeah, these are some open questions on how to um, place PCM in the memory hierarchy. Uh, uh, will we, will, how, should, how should PCM come into the overall picture? Uh, shall it be ad um, separately addressable from, from DRAM if both memory technologies were to be uh, employed? Shall it be separately addressable from the OS side or shall, shall DRAM act as a cache that's not explicitly addressable but managed by hardware to a main memory that's completely composed of PCM that's address, uh, addressed by the OS or shall we just have main memory using PCM? Um, these are open questions uh, and how to mitigate the shortcomings of phase change memory. Um, if, if phase change, yes? So phase change memory is about, um, I think the previous slide said about four, at least the read latency is about four times that of DRAM. Um, and that's comparable within an order of magnitude, but it's still slower, I guess. And um, I, I will show some um, results of what happens if we just go and use, if we just use phase change memory as a drop in DRAM replacement, how much slowdown that incurs, I, I, will, I will show in the following slide.
Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, how do we take advantage of the non-volatility uh, that is offered in, in PCM? Um, yeah. So at least a lot of current research um, proposes having a hybrid memory system that has some amount of DRAM and some amount of phase change memory um, to such that you can exploit the best of, of both memory technologies. Um, DRAMs, low latency, low dynamic energy consumption, high endurance, and PCMs, high capacity, uh, and slash non-volatility, I guess. Um, and there has been some works that look at how to place data between the, these two memory technologies. What is the optimal way of doing this? Um, so some, some questions about hybrid memory systems is looking at uh, where do you place data? How do you, what, what do, for what, um, what's the decision process for placing one data in PCM versus DRAM, say? Um, and if we're going to, say, in runtime, move data around PCM and DRAM, what's the algorithm to do that? Uh, when should we do that? How do we do that efficiently? Um, yeah, and uh, just in general, how do we design memory controllers? How do we uh, form the cache hierarchy uh, that's aware of these DRAM slash PCM hybrid memories are uh, research challenges in, hi in hybrid memory systems. Okay, so emerging memory technologies. Um, so one work looked at uh, just using phase change memory and replacing DRAM altogether with it. Um, so this is the same paper that I was referring to before that has the survey of the recent PCM prototypes and um, showed some like parameters um, for potential future PCM products. And uh, so this paper, yeah, yeah, um, shows the prototypes. And uh, it derives some, some numbers, some, some latency numbers, some endurance numbers that we might be able to expect from PCM um, considering the, the recent prototypes. Um, so they're highlighted there, uh, latency, density, energy, endurance. I've talked about these. And um, so this paper shows results of what would happen, say, if we just replaced DRAM altogether with phase change memory. And uh, so, so uh, it shows results for uh, an evaluation that involves a four core system using a four megabyte L2 cache. And um, PCM is, is organized the same as DRAM. So we're just taking the, the DRAM memory elements and replacing those with phase change memory elements. Um, what we see overall is for different benchmarks, overall on average, um, a 1.6x delay in the overall memory ex uh, program execution um, compared to DRAM. So, so these, uh, these results are normalized to DRAM. So, oh yeah, it says normalized to DRAM. So one is the, the level at which DRAM would be performing and PCM can be shown to be overshooting that quite significantly. Um, two, two, two times two X energy and 500 hour average lifetime. That's because we can only write to PCM a finite number of times. So, you know, after we write to it a certain number of times, then uh, it, it's, it's done its lifetime. Um, and what this paper proposes is um, to re-architect uh, the PCM uh, internal, in the internal uh, memory microarchitecture of, of PCM to make it more usable uh, in, in memory, in, in for memory systems. So um, I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit about how, how memory um, circuits are organized. Uh, and I'm going to eventually talk about row buffers and this is going to come up a, um, a few times. So I think it's worth describing it in a, a bit of detail. Um, so the way memory devices are organized is that um, there's a cell, whether it be something like, like a DRAM cell, um, uh, something like there's your capacitor, 
And there's your access transistor that will be connected to the word line. Uh, and you know, this will be connecting to your bit line. I'll explain what these are. So essentially, this, this memory element is, 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 this, is this bit, I guess. Or if it were phase change memory, you just replace this capacitor with a, with a variable resistor. But, um, so you have a memory element. And the way memory systems are typically organized is that we have the, lots of these memory elements. And we organize them into rows and columns. So this is a row. And this is a column. And all of the cells in a row are connected to this common word line. Um, so this is like a word. And all of the cells that are connected to a common, uh, so, so all of the cells in a, in a column are connected to um, something called the bit line. And how memory typically works is that when we read some um, data from memory, we read it in the granularity of, of these rows. So what happens is this bit line will be connected to something called a, a sense amplifier. And so say, for example, so every, every column will have its own sense amplifier. And when we are, say, if we are reading this row, then this word line will be asserted. So it will go up. And then all of these, all of the cells would be, would be its, its, its contents would be detected by the sense amplifier, which then feeds that value to some other I.O. or external um, input-output circuit. And, and essentially what happens is um, this is called an activate. When, once the data is in the sense amplifier, um, we can read data from the sense amplifiers very quickly. They're, they're latched. And to read data that's latched in the, in the, in the sample, sense amplifiers, these, this, this battery of sense amplifiers is also called the row buffer. Once the data is latched here, then we can read it off very quickly, like data in this one or this one. But we incur another significant, we, we incur a significant delay, say, if we wanted to read the, the contents of another row. If that were to happen, then we'd need to assert this word line and replace whatever data is latched in the row buffer with, with new data of the cells that we're reading. So this is eff effectively, this, you can think of the row buffer uh, as being a cache for the most recently accessed um, row, if you will. And that's how typical memory systems are organized. Um, and the proposal of this paper was basically um, to instead of, instead of having a very large uh, row buffer, let's use multiple short row buffers. It's like having, having um, a, a cache, like on an, an on-chip uh, cache on PCM. Because um, data usually, so, so the width of this can be something like um, four kilobytes. And this, this paper um, essentially says, instead of having one massive uh, row buffer of four kilobytes, for phase change memory, you'd rather use, say, break this into four bits and say have four, four row buffers of one kilobytes each and use them in an associative manner, like an associative four-way cache. That's, that's uh, the proposal. Um, and idea two, so that's, yeah, so that's idea one, use multiple narrow row buffers in each uh, PCM chip because um, some, a lot of memory, a lot of uh, applications tend to access um, it's like a less, than, less than four kilobytes at a time. Um, and having, having four, uh, having multiple row buffers, shorter ones in the same area will, um, increase the number of times that you actually can serve data from the row buffer instead of having to activate another row. Uh, and idea number two is um, keeping track of which data is dirty at the cache block or word granularity. And if you do that, then when it comes to writing, evicting, um, when, it, when it comes to writing dirty data to PCM from the cache, then you can selectively write those, uh, 
um, dirty, dirty cache blocks. So this is inside the memory. Um, so inside the memory, let's keep track of which uh, cache blocks need to be, be written. Because what usually happens is typically a whole row is written back and read from in one go. But instead of that, you'd say, like, let's say, if we, if we know that only these two bits are dirty, then we'll just write those two bits and save us from having to write to the other bits in the row. Um, that also increases the, it reduces the write energy, also increases the, um, the well, uh, it, it, yeah, it reduces the unnecessary wear in the PCM device. And uh, so with this optimization, with this um, re, re, re -architecting, uh, there are those are the improved um, numbers, the results for, for base change in memory compared to DRAM. Um, so I think it was 1.6 x delay before. Yeah, that's down to 1.2. Energy is now on par with DRAM. And yeah, much longer lifetime for base change memory. Uh, yeah, some, some caveats. So still, um, there are other, other uh, issues that need to be addressed with using phase change memory. We, we see it on average that um, you know, execution lifetime yeah, has increased, but uh, really to, to have a, a dependable system, we need to know, we need to have some guarantees as to what the worst case lifetime will be. Um, and uh, different, different application will, will slow down by using phase change memory by different amounts. So. Um, whether, whether we can uh, ensure that even the slowest, um, even the applications that slow down the most can, whether their slow, slowdowns can be bounded, um, and whether uh, this, 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 pa uh, this paper uses PCM parameters that are a bit optimistic, those are, those are all caveats about the paper. Um, okay, and now, I'm going to talk about some other systems. So um, like I said before, currently uh, the community is uh, looking a lot towards hybrid memory systems, so a memory system that uses DRAM and PCM together to get the best of both worlds. Um, so DRAM would be used somewhat like a cache where you would typically put in um, hot, hot data, hot pages, because it has fast access latency, it's durable, um, and phase change memory could be used as uh, the backing store. So some, it's the relationship of DRAM and PCM is typically thought to be of something like the relationship between the cache and the memory, or you know, between, the, between memory and the disk, um, something, something like that. So it's a familiar concept. Um, and yeah, different, uh, I guess, research is going on to look into how, how to partition data between these two memory technologies in an efficient way. Uh, so this is another um, uh, work that uses DRM as a, a cache to PCM. And yeah, essentially, essentially, it's really kind of just using DRAM as a cache to PCM, although there are some, um, uh, some ideas in, in this paper uh, that act to mitigate some undesirable effects of phase change memory. Um, so yeah, we have a, a DRAM in this, in this paper, they propose a DRAM cache that's completely governed by hardware, not explicitly addressable by the OS. So the OS only sees you know, what it sees, uh, a, a memory space that's addressable, and those are mapped to PCM. But the, in the hardware, uh, there's an intermediate DRAM buffer um, that will that will act as a cache between the processor and the PCM main memory, um, and the PCM write queue is there because write backs to PCM the write latency is a lot higher than read latency is. So there's a, a, a write queue to um, compensate for for high write latencies to to PCM. Um, so some some ideas in the paper is that. Uh, um, 
something called lazy writes. So for example, um, if it were a cache, you didn't, you, if, if say some processor was requesting for some, some data uh, in memory and it was not in the cache, then what you typically do is the, the cache would first go to memory and fetch the data and store it in itself. So the cache has the data. And then um, the processor would again go and get the data from the cache. So the data is now both in the cache and in the processor. But this, this lazy write mechanism is something different in the sense that when it gets data for the first time, it'll just put it straight into DRAM and not put it into PCM. This is because even if we write the data to PCM, we don't know if it's going to be written to a lot. And writing that data to PCM could be somewhat inefficient. It could just incur lots of um, write latency, write energy, and in the end, we might not end up using that uh, data so much. So that's um, something called lazy write. Partial writes is um, something, so this is, it's, it's uh, basically keeping track of which pages are, are dirty um, within, within the DRAM buffer, so in, in at, a, at a more fine granularity than the page. So which, which cache lines are dirty in the DRAM buffer, selectively writing them back to PCM when that page is being evicted from the DRAM cache. And page bypass is, um, uh, so when we're evicting pages from, from DRAM, if we, if we know um, that, for example, if we're, if, if we're uh, going through an application that's, that's streaming through memory, then we know that after we uh, use a page once, we're unlikely to use it again in, um, in, uh, in any near future. So we're not going to write, back, write that back to PCM main memory. We're just going to evict it completely from main memory. So certain um, ideas to uh, make PCM main memory work, work well with DRAM. And uh, here are some results for, from that paper. So 16 core system, and they have uh, different, different um, configurations. So from the, oh, and one assumption is that PCM is four times denser than DRAM. So in the same amount of silicon, uh, if you had like four gigabytes of DRAM, for PCM you'd have 16 gigabytes of of PCM. It's just a rough um, approximation. And also they assume that PCM is four times slower than DRAM at the same time. And, uh, and yeah, they assume a, sa uh, like, um, a same block size for DRAM and PCM. So if you, if you look at the, the, uh, the average on the very right hand side, there's um, one configuration that's an eight gigabyte DRAM memory system and then there's a 32 gigabyte PCM system. Um, now, the 32 gigabyte PCM system will perform uh, better than the eight gigabyte DRAM system because uh, it incurs less page faults. Because when, when you have a, a fixed amount of main memory, you're going to experience page faults, but with a 32 gigabyte mem main memory, you're going to experience a lot less page faults. So, um, the gain is coming from reduced page faults, and then there are, um, there's another 32 gigabyte DRAM next to that. Now that performs better than 32 gigabytes of PCM because all the, the number of page faults are the same. Each access to me main memory is, is quicker in the DRAM case. And then at, at finally, um, there's the hybrid memory system at the very end that has 32 gigabytes of PCM plus the one gigabyte DRAM hardware cache. That's the proposed architecture, uh, which performs roughly similar to having 32 gigabytes of DRAM. Um, so it's 5.30 now. So um, I, I, I guess you guys wanted to go and go to that thing that you were mentioning. So uh, we'll reconvene in about uh, 10 minutes. Cool. And at the end of the day, what they try to achieve is um, with a 32 gigabyte PCM trying to achieve performance close to uh, a system that has 32 gigabytes of DRAM with you know, using a one gigabyte DRAM cache. And uh, yeah, and here are some power energy um, and energy and delay product numbers. Uh, so the hybrid system um, bridges, bridges like the gap between the eight gigabyte DRAM and the 32 gigabyte um, DRAM case. Uh, well, I guess, I guess 
So it's more, more worth comparing just the blue and the green bar, the hybrid case and the 32 gigabyte DRAM case. Um, and yeah, it, uh, here we see a lot of um, uh, gains of the hybrid system compared to the all, all DRAM system. Um, so DRM as a cache for PCM. Uh, so yeah, um, it's, it's about using DRAM. It's, it's trying to get the, the best of um, both memory technologies using DRAM for the low latency, low dynamic energy, high endurance, but using um, phase change memory as, as the backing store to, to DRAM uh, for its high capacity um, low idle energy. And uh, in, in the previous case, um, yeah, the hardware managed the, the DRAM cache and it was invisible to the OS. Everything was, it was managed in hardware. Um, so some issues with a DRAM, having a DRAM cache to PCM is what data, how shall we place data between DRAM and PCM? In the previous case, we used DRAM as, as just a, a cache. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there were there were some additional techniques involved, but um, it was it was like a cache. So basically, you know, whenever you access data, you see if it's in DRAM. If it's not, then you go to PCM. You fetch the data, um, um, and if the data is in DRAM, then you just go go and use it from there. Uh, but is there anything more that we can do in that realm uh, for better for performance, higher efficiency? Where should we place data be between DRAM and PCM? Um, what is the right, what is a good granularity of data movement between DRAM and PCM? Um, and how do we uh, design a low cost hardware managed DRAM cache? I'll talk about that uh, more soon. And um, I'm going to talk about two works in specific, uh, specifically. Uh, one is about locality over data placement and the other um, talks about tag stores uh, for a DRAM cache to PCM. So the first one is row locality over data placement um, so one observation in, in a hybrid memory system with DRAM and PCM is that DRAM and PCM both have row buffers, which is what I was talking about before. And whether it be DRAM or PCM, row buffer hit latency is essentially um, not accessing the memory elements themselves. It's about accessing the peripheral circuitry, the, the sense amplifiers, in the memory uh, device. So robot for hit latency, robot, what I mean by robot for hit is if, you, if you're requesting some data from memory and the data is already latched in, in the row buffer, then that's called a robot for hit. But if the data that you requested is not latched in the row buffer, then you need to go to some, some row in memory and activate that row. That's called a robot for miss. And that's actually where you go and access the memory elements themselves, whether it be capacitors or calcogenide or memory stores, MTJ, or magnetical tunnel junctions. Um, so robot for hit latency is similar in DRAM and PCM, because it's not about mem the memory element, it's about the peripheral circuitry. And during a robot for miss is where you would experience the, the, the latency difference between different memory technologies. And um, so here we see a pictorial representation of a processor and uh, um, different, uh, on one hand, a uh, DRAM memory, on the other hand, a PCM memory. Um, and memory devices are organized into banks that can be operated uh, in parallel, and uh, each bank would have their own, own row buffer. So essentially, um, where we experience the high PCM access latency is during a row buffer misaccess in phase change memory. That's what we should, if we, that's what we should avoid because that's where we're paying the penalty of using highly scalable phase change memory. Um, so the idea behind row locality aware data placement is we're going to try to identify data that is usually accessed in a manner that is, that misses in the row buffer. Um, and those data that frequently cause row buffer conflicts we're going to collect them and place them in DRAM because we'd rather suffer the low DRAM row buffer miss latency than suffer the, the high PCM row buffer miss latency. That's the key idea. 
Um, and also we want to use those data that are reused many times so that we're making most use of our DRAM cache. Um, so basically if the data is highly reused and it's always missing in the row buffer, then that's gonna go to DRAM. That's the idea of lo locality aware data placement. Um, yeah, so for example, you could imagine um, if, if some uh, application were to stream across memory, so it's just getting the next memory address and the next memory address and the next memory address, and once it uses that bit of memory, it usually won't access it again for a long time. If that's the type of um, memory access you're dealing with, then it's, it's okay to leave all the memory in, in PCM because most of the, once your row is open and latched in the row buffer, the subsequent data accesses um, uh, to contiguous memory will likely be um, in, in your row buffer anyways, and you'll, you'll mostly um, likely hit in the row buffer frequently. Uh, in that case, you can afford, uh, to, if you will, to, to put your data in PCM. But if you have an application that's uh, um, accessing some bit of data and always causing a row buffer miss, then you'd be better off pl placing it in DRAM. Um, yeah, so, so how, how uh, this mechanism works is that um, we track how many row buffer uh, conflicts. So but what I mean by row buffer conflict is um, when, when basically a row buffer miss is a row buffer conflict. We track the number of row buffer misses and see where they happen in the memory um, space. Uh, and when we identify certain rows that cause many frequent row buffer misses, we migrate that data into DRAM. Um, that's, that's what uh, this mechanism does. Um, yeah, once, once, once the number of row, row buffer misses exceed a certain threshold, that row is, is moved to DRAM. Um, and concerning the threshold uh, of, of how many row buffer miss is enough for that data to be migrated into uh, DRAM from PCM, um, what we do is what, what, there's a, a, a cost and benefit analysis basically looking at um, uh, what the cost of migrating uh, a row of data from PCM to DRAM is and um, what the benefit is uh, by, by doing that migration. And um, there are details in the paper. Uh, so I'll show some results um, the, f um, for this paper. The, method, uh, the, the methodology as, is um, as shown. So there's a core model. It's a 16-core uh, multi-programmed workload simulation. Uh, we use a 1 gigabyte DRAM cache and 16 gigabytes of PCM main memory uh, with the following uh, memory latency parameters. And we're caching data at 4 kilobyte granularities. So it's a, it's a large um, cache block size. And here's uh, some performance num um, plots. So, for eight, so there are 18 server workloads and 18 cloud type workloads. So server type workloads are those like transaction processing C or H, C, TPC C or H type workloads. Um, cloud is more of a, a combination of uh, TPC workloads, web servers, video processing, those kind of workloads. And FREQ is, um, is the baseline shown here. It's uh, a mechanism where frequently accessed data, so hot data, is placed in, in DRAM. And RBLA is the row buffer locality aware mechanism um, proposed in this paper. That is the one that tracks row buffer misses and to two different rows and uh, migrates rows that have high number of row buffer misses into DRAM. And we see um, the RBLA mechanism performing uh, better. The dyne is where the threshold for migration is um, uh, determined dynamically on runtime uh, using the cost benefit analysis of row, migra of row migrations, of data migrations. And the benefits come from better buff row buffer locality in, in phase change memory, since we're moving the row buffer missing data from uh, PCM to DRAM. And um, also reduce bandwidth consumption uh, because um, the row buffer, in the row buffer, lo lo row buffer locality aware case, less migrations happen. We keep a lot of row buffer hitting data in PCM and we leave it there. Um, and also reduced pollution in the, the DRAM cache 
So if a data, if some data hits in the robot for frequently, it's not going to go into DRAM. We're going to use that space to put other um, row buffer missing data in, in DRAM, because that's the best use of DRAM. Um, so compared to an all, PC, all PCM main memory, uh, this method, the, the RBLA Dyn method, has a 31% performance improvement. And compared to the all DRAM main memory, it comes to within 29% performance of the all DRAM main memory. Um, so that's row locality aware data placement. Um, uh, so that was about uh, trying to decide on which data to put in DRAM and PCM in a DRAM PCM hybrid memory system. Or it, it could be some other type of uh, memory system, not, maybe not PCM, as long as there's a row buffer in the memory technology, which very will likely be the case, this kind of um, uh, row locality aware data placement can be uh, applied. Um, another uh, uh, work regarding hybrid memory systems we will look at is um, enabling efficient DRAM caches. And um, so the problem is this. Uh, if, so let's say we have a DRAM cache to PCM. Now, we know in a, in a cache we have these things called cache tags. And uh, because these cache tags have to be stored um, somewhere, so, so, so we, we use a cache tag to identify if the data that we have in the cache is indeed the data that's being requested. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, 740 and 447 covered cache tags a lot. Um, and the problem is, if we have a large DRAM cache, say on the order of like a gigabyte, then, and we had very small granularity blocks in the DRAM cache, then the amount of cache tags we would need to store would be huge. Um, we'd, we'd need a lot of, a lot of um, just SRAM space, if you will, to store these cache tags. So what um, previous works, uh, the ones we saw uh, before, the, the row buffer locality replacement and also the one before that, um, used, assumed uh, a large DRAM cache block. So they were on the order of like four kilobytes. And the reason, one of the reasons why the, the DRAM cache block was so large is because if you don't have cache blocks that are that large in DRAM, then the amount of tag storage space would just be huge. Um, and they would have to go somewhere to manage the DRAM cache. Um, and this work is looking at how can we uh, still have small cache blocks in DRAM um, and, and do something smart about the cache tags. The reason why we want small cache blocks in DRAM is because uh, by having ha um, large cache blocks, now, now um, this, this theme has al al also been um, touched upon in, in, in 447, I believe. Uh, how big a cache block do you want? It's, you, don't, you don't want it to be too big or too small, right? If you have it too big, unless your application is exhibiting that much spatial locality, um, having, having a huge block won't help because you'll only access a few bytes maybe of like that four kilobyte block and you'll end up evicting that block very soon. Um, on the other hand, if you have a cache block that's so small, if that's a few bytes, then you won't be able to exploit special locality and you'll experience a lot of cache misses. So modern systems typically use about 64 bytes or 32 bytes, 128 bytes, those kind of cache block granularities. Um, can we have that kind of cache block granularities in a huge DRAM cache that's on the order of gigabytes. Um, so what this work does, um, yeah, so this is just the process of looking up data in, in, in a cache. So uh, we're looking for some data X and um, some, some cache tag uh, storage is needed to tell us whether this data X is in DRAM or PCM. If it's in DRAM, then we'll go and get it from will access the data X from DRAM, and that will be shipped to um, the CPU that requested the data. Um, so this idea, uh, this, this other, uh, so, so, um, so, so I, I'm talking about the ideas presented in this paper. Uh, tags in memory, it's basically about push, putting the tag store not in a separate SRAM structure that's dedicated to storing the, the tag the, the ta cache tags, but instead we're going to distribute the tags 
with the cache blocks inside memory. And we're going to have it such that um, a corresponding uh, cache block and its tag will be stored in, in the same row. And the benefit of, of that is that um, whenever we're looking up data, uh, whether, you know, to see if, if that data is in the, the cache, we first look for the cache tag, right? And once we've retrieved the cache tag, we know whether the data that we want is in, in, in the cache or whether it's not. Now let's say it is indeed in the cache. Then, if we, then because we put the cache tag and the corresponding data in the same row, we can go and get the corresponding data if it is in the cache um, on a row buffer hit access because we've already opened that row just to get the tag. Does that make sense? So, so you could imagine, say, if the cache tags were stored in some other part of memory, let's say you know, in some um, DRM address, we're going to dedicate some addresses to store the cache tags. So whenever um, we're wanting to retrieve data from memory, we first have to check whether this data is in DRAM or PCM. So let's look at the cache tags. The cache tags are in DRAM. That's tags in memory. So we go and uh, you know, fetch some, some row address in DRAM, and we retrieve the cache tag. And it turns out that the data is indeed in, in, in DRAM. So it's in the DRAM cache. We don't have to go to PCM. Um, so it can be uh, direct mapped, or it could be. Um, uh, but but you could you could imagine you read all those tags, and all those so so that DRAM row could be housing one set, if you will. So. So, so, so um, with this scheme, we're trying to get cache blocks that are very small, like, that are like 64 bytes, say, for example. And let's say um, we have three um, drawn there. Let's say all those cache blocks are 64 bytes. And, or, or we have many of them. We have many of them. And the tags are stored in the same row. And as long, if, we, if we check all of those tags, then we're checking uh, effectively whether all of those cache blocks any of those cache blocks are, is, is the cache block that we want. So in that sense, it can be ways associative. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to what I was saying, um, after we ret retrieve the tag, uh, let's say the tag says um, the data is stored in some DRM address, you have to go and get it again. And that will incur another, say, row activate. But if we store the tag and the data in the same row, after retrieving the tag, and you know, finding out whether the tag, whether the data is in indeed DRAM or not. If it is in DRAM, then we don't need to go and activate another row, because the data is already in the row that we just opened, because it's because the tag and the data are in the same row. Does that make sense? Okay, so please ask questions if that doesn't make sense. Um, so so that's that's the idea: tags in memory and placing the tag and the corresponding data in the same row, so that. Um, if we do want to access the, the block in DRAM, if the block is in DRAM and we're going to access it, then we can just you know, get it from the peripheral circuitry, from the row buffer, without having to activate another row. Um, so Yes, it'll most likely be in the memory controller. Yes, if it were implemented in hard, where, which, which should be the case. So the benefit of this is um, instead of having this huge SRAM space, like megabytes and megabytes of SRAM space just for storing the you know, uh, incredible amount of cache tags we need for having such small granularity uh, cache blocks in gigabytes of DRAM, instead of having that, we, we are distributing the tags all across DRAM, uh, the, the cache itself, um, and no separate uh, SRAM storage, on-chip storage is needed for storing the tags. Uh, so that's the benefit of this scheme. If it wasn't for this, then you know, we'd have to have some SRAM structure to store the tags in, and we'd be looking up that structure for the cache tags every time we want to access memory. Uh, the downside is that um, 
So we need to access DRAM to, to you know, find out where the, where the data is. And this could look like a huge um, downside, but I will show you later the results of this uh, mechanism. And yeah, cache it requires two DRAM accesses, but only one DRAM activate. That's the important thing. And DRAM activate is, is, um, is, is where the, the, the latency is. So, um, so cache tags in DRAM. Uh, okay, so another idea is, um, so the very, uh, so um, another, uh, the second idea in this, in this paper is, so for those cache tags that are accessed very frequently, we're gonna have not a huge SRAM structure, but a very small XRAM structure to, source, to store just a few cache tags. Um, about uh, the size of about one thousandth of, of, of what we would have if we didn't store the tags in memory. And the third idea in this paper is um, to have dynamic transfer, data transfer granularity. So what this means is, um, uh, so before we had a fixed uh, amount of data transfer size between DRAM and uh, PCM that was typically four kilobytes, the size of one huge cache block in DRAM. But in this case, uh, we're going to have um, some mechanism as to determine what transfer granularity uh, gives us um, good performance in a, in a DRAM uh, PCM hybrid memory system. Um, and the way this works is by having um, certain rows always transfer at certain granularities. So some rows will always transfer at, say, 64 byte granularities. Some rows will always transfer data between the DRAM and PCM at, say, you know, larger granularities. And we have certain rows that are dedicated to transferring rows at different, different cache block sizes. And among them, we'll see, um, compared to their data transfer granularities, what kind of um, data accesses, how many data accesses they, they result in, in the cache. And we're going to go with um, the, 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 the transfer size that has the most um, amount of cache accesses compared to you know, the amount of data that's being transferred between the two. Does that make sense? Um, so basically we're trying out different types of data access transfer granularities. Uh, say um, transferring data between DRAM and PCM every time, say for 64 bytes or 128 bytes at a time, 256 bytes at a time. And we're gonna look at those um, different transfers and see which transfer usually gives us, you know, compared to the amount of data that's being transferred, which, which granularity gives us, you know, the most number of DRAM cache hits. And, and then we're gonna choose that as an optimal data transfer granularity. So this is a pictorial representation um, showing, showing timber or tags in memory uh, management. Um, yeah, so this just shows um, how, how, how data retrieving works. If we're, we're going to get um, some row in DRAM. Uh, so, so in order to check whether some amount of, uh, some bit of data is in DRAM or PCM, we have to get the tags, and the tags will be uh, in a certain location in DRAM. And if the cache blocks are indeed in, in DRAM, then the, da the data will be in the same row as the tag. Uh, yeah, and, and there will be a small SRAM buffer that caches in um, the tags that are most recently uh, accessed. So, so there's a cache, but there's another cache for the tags. So yeah, um, they're separate caches. Uh, so yeah, so this is just um, uh, like a scenario showing, say we, if, we want to, if we want data X from memory, um, then we're going to first look at the buffer that stores the cache tags. This is an SRAM cache, not the DRAM cache. There are two, two different caches. One is the DRAM cache to PCM. The other is the SRAM cache that only stores tags that are most, that are usually stored in DRAM. Okay, yeah. So it's a two level kind of thing. So we look at the, um, uh, the buffer, the SRAM buffer, and um, yeah, if the data X so, so this is case one in case a timber hit. So if the tag is in uh, the SRAM cache, 
then we're going, we can just um, find out if the data is in DRAM or PCM just by looking up this SRAM structure, which, is, which will be a very quick lookup, and we'll get that uh, data X from DRAM. If it's a timber miss, that means the cache tag that we want is not in SRAM, so we're going to go for the tags in memory, which, which will be in DRAM. And if the data is in DRAM, the corresponding data will be in the same row in DRAM. Okay, so this is uh, uh, such a case where we look up the timber, but the cache tag, uh, the, 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 cache, the, the tag we want, the cache tag we want is not in the SRAM buffer. So we have to look up the tags in memory. Um, so that's M of Y. And once we get M of Y, we uh, update the SRAM um, structure with the most recent tag, tags we retrieved. And then uh, by the time we already have that you know, new row 143, we've already opened that row in DRAM. So we're going to go and get that cache block um, if, if the data is in DRAM. But uh, we're going to be able to retrieve it at a low latency because we've already um, opened that row. Yes, so it'll be accessing the data why itself will be a row hit. And if the cache tags tell us that the data is not in, in, in DRAM, then well, we'll have to go to PCM, because that's where the data will be. Yeah, so um, here's some methodology uh, for, for uh, the results in this paper. Um, eight cores running at four gigahertz. Um, half a gigabyte of DRAM, eight gigabytes of PCM, that's the main uh, backing store, and uh, yeah, 128 byte caching granularity, that's the base granularity, and there's a, a, a dynamic scheme that adjusts that amount dynamically, like I mentioned before, and uh, different types of um, base comparison points. So we can have an all SRAM system, that's where we actually get you know, somehow eight megabytes of SRAM uh, and store all the tags for the 512 megabytes worth of DRAM in SRAM. Um, that's going to be a lot of SRAM space kind of used not very efficiently. And then we have the region me metadata storage. That's dedicating some addresses in DRAM and, and putting all the, uh, all the cache tags in some address in DRAM. Now, that's not going to um, have the row buffer hit uh, aspect we talked about. Where So basically, in the second case, because we're not storing the caches, the cache tags in the same um, row as the corresponding data, uh, after get, retrieving the cache tag, there will be probably there will be possibly another row buffer miss access to retrieve the cache block itself. And then we have Tim tags in memory uh, metadata storage. So that's where we place the cache tag and the corresponding um, data in the same row. And Timber is Tim with the added small SRAM structure that stores the very recently addressed, uh, accessed uh, cache tags. And that's only eight kilobytes of SRAM, so that's a thousandth of what you would need if you just took all the cache tags and put them in this one huge SRAM structure. For that, you'd need eight, eight megabytes. Um, oops, sorry, I think I pressed the wrong key. Okay, so here we are. And uh, so this is performance numbers for the different um, um, comparison points I mentioned. And so between the region, so the region-based um, scheme is kind of like the worst scheme you could imagine. Like you have to do a DRAM access just to get the tag, and another DRAM access, po probably, possibly a row buffer miss to get the data itself from DRAM. That's the region case. But in the TIM case, after getting the, the tag itself from memory, the corresponding data is going to be in the same row so the, at least you know, the data itself, you'll be able to get it at, um, at, a, at a row buffer hit access latency. So that's, that's uh, the reason for the improved performance from, oh, this is going on its own, uh, from, from uh, Tim to, sorry, region to Tim. And from Tim to Timber, where, where you have that small eight kilobyte SRAM structure that stores the most recently accessed cache tags. So that also gives you a speed up. And now Timber, Comparing Timber, okay, so there's another step. So Timber Dyn is the one where we have certain rows that are um, transferring data at specific uh, granularities. And we look at them and we try to find out which caching granularity is the best. And we go for the, with the best um, uh, kind of dynamic caching granularity. Uh, that's Timber Dyn. And we actually see that for performance, 
Timberdine and, S, and, and SRAM, having like all the cache tags in SRAM is, is similar. So this uh, enables um, a, a fine granularity DRAM cache economically without having to use tons and tons of SRAM. And this is uh, energy efficiency. So um, with, with a dynamic uh, a, a transfer granularity between um, PCM and DRAM, we're able to um, do more efficient uh, granularity transfers. So this is why we gain in terms of energy efficiency. Um, so I think I only have like three slides left now. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so there's a lot of research going on about how to um, incorporate non-volatile memory into existing computer architectures to um, have high-performing uh, memory. Uh, and there are also lots of other open questions about how to tolerate errors, error mechanisms in you know, phase, phase change memory or SCT MRAM. They're all very different compared to DRAM. How do we uh, enable um, the secure operation? Uh, how do we uh, enable data security is also another question. How do we minimize cost? Um, how do we exploit non-volatility? These are um, open, open-ended questions. Uh, lots of research are going. A lot of research is going on in, this, in these areas, and uh, yeah. Um, whoops. So, yeah. Other other um, particular challenges in emerging memory technologies is, like I mentioned, uh, the endurance problem. Like after you write a certain number of times, you can't write to memory anymore. Um, that's the endurance problem. Also, non volatility kind of. Uh, lets itself to possible um, data privacy issues because even if you, so with, with DRAM, uh, the model was that everything you write to disk is non-volatile, but everything that's in memory is volatile. So you turn the power off and everything in memory is, is wiped away with time, I guess. Um, but that's the, that was the kind of the, the model. But um, with non-volatile memory, even if you turn the power off, then you're, you're still going to have memory uh, data left in your memory. So uh, supposedly, maybe somebody could retrieve that information. Um, so existing existing security programs would probably have to be reevaluated on how they, uh, you know, in, ensure privacy and security. Okay, uh, and. Uh, also, there, yeah, um, so different aspects about multiple bits per cell. Um, also, all, all there, there are um, points, weakness points, where data could potentially be uh, leaked out. For example, um, so if, for example, let's say you have four, four, levels in, um, per, four levels per cell in an MLC. Okay, so I'm just going to say, Let's say we have a cell that you can store two bits on. That's what MLC is about, multi-level cell. And certain non-volatile memory technologies um, allow this. Now, the, the time it takes to read one of these bits will be affected by whatever the contents are in this other bit. So even if you just give somebody access rights to read this one bit, they might be able to infer what the data is in this other bit. So that's the, that's the weakness point. Um, so yeah, um, different uh, ways, basically, um, research about how to uh, deal with these um, aspects. So those are all the slides. Um, uh, please be reminded that pro project proposals are due for uh, Tuesday. And um, yeah, owner wanted me to hold extended office hours tomorrow. Um, so I'll, I'll have them tomorrow from 11 to 1 p.m. But Please uh, do write me an email if you plan to come so that I know you're coming. I might be uh, walking in and out of my office. So uh, yeah, that's tomorrow. And that's, that's it for today. Thank you. Oh, so you're talking about, um, say, adding a bit in the TLB yes. to um, decide uh, to to uh, say. 
right, to determine whether the data is in um, PCM or DRAM. Okay, but in that case, because, so I guess this is where uh, the OS and the hardware will have some like pre-agreement between those two. Um, like for example, I think in mo most, like a lot of systems, they assume like a fixed four kilobyte page granularity and there'll be one TLB entry per one OS page, right? So if you're doing that, uh, then for one thing is you'll be, I guess, confined to the four kilobyte data granularity. Um, that's, I guess, one, one aspect of it. Um, Uh, I'm sorry, could you please repeat so, that? Yeah, if, if, you, if the data was last time in the PCM, uh, PCM yeah, yeah. PCM, yeah, it has a problem. And uh, you migrated it to DRAM, but uh, TLB has a preference between getting it for the PCM. Then you will have a problem. If the data is, is um. Yeah, if your TLB entry is outdated. Okay, outdated, yeah, okay. Definitely. And right. you migrate the data later. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, if you're involving the OS, I think there are like, um, so it might be possible, but I, I actually I did, I did consider this, just using the, the, the page table and the TLB structure um, to, to house this data. I think um, there are certain, I can't remember what they were, but there are certain, I think, cases where you have to be, be careful because either the TLB or the page table can be outdated or it requires some OS inter interaction that causes um, a long latency um, to access data because uh, you, you have to actually get the kernel to work for you instead of hardware just telling you almost, like at, at hardware latency, telling you where the, uh, the, data, the, the data is. But um, if it's not the page table, so in, uh, before I, I considered mostly the page table, not the TLB, but if it's the TLB, um, I, I, I'm, Uh, yes, but only, so I guess the TLB is a cache for the page table, right? Um, but then, but then, yeah, you could also have uh, data that's not in the TLB and only in memory. So I think, I think, um, I'd have to think about it, I guess. Maybe, it, maybe it's a potential solution, but you would be confined to that four kilobyte granularity. Yeah. 